And talk about the significance of them choosing Cambridge, um, that that's now who they represent, the new uh, couple, uh, Kate Middleton and, uh, Prince w and Prince William. Well, I think it's just part of a broader... I mean, you know, Cambridge is just one part of Britain, so I don't think there's a great deal of symbolism in that. But, you know, the, the, there's been this attempt to present Kate Middleton as, you know, infusing a kind of working-class ethic into, into the Windsor family. So bear in mind, she went to one of the most expensive schools in Britain and has never had a job. It's a very revealing sign of the snobbery that somehow someone like that is treated as if there's some kind of Dickensian street urchin, just because somewhere down the line, someone in her family was a I coal miner generations ago. College, well, she only worked for six months, so she's, she's never had a paid job. Hmm. So the attention, I mean, that you couldn't turn on a news program today uh, to yeah. watch news. Everyone starting early, early in the morning, this in the United States, yeah. um, uh, is showing right now um, the wedding and all that is happening live since something like 4 o'clock this morning. It's absolutely bizarre. It's bizarre. And I don't understand why Americans are so into this. I mean, I understand it's part of a celebrity culture. Charlie Sheen goes crazy. Kate and William get married. It's part of that frenzy. I don't think it suggests some kind of latent monarchical sympathies here in, here in America. I hope not, anyway. You know, I mean, I don't think... Is the coverage so much greater than, say, Chelsea Clinton's wedding? I suppose it is. But I think it's part of the same phenomenon of just kind of empty celebrity sugar. Uh, the biggest mm. moment now, as we are broadcasting, is the first kiss that is being broadcast. <laughs> You know, um, it's very nice, but my, my deal was, look, if we're going to spend $100 million on, on this, we have to spend a comparable amount of money distributing anti-nausea tablets across the world to all the people who can't bear to see all this, you know. It's and not like a gradual young Britain? couple kissing each other, it's nice, you know, but... God, you know, the, I'm not going to get this when I get married. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to get all this attention. And nor is anyone else in Britain, you know, it's, it's not a sensible way to The interest in Britain? You know, there's some, there's, there's a, a small minority who are really passionately monarchist. There's a broader majority who don't really think about these issues except once every five years. And then, you know, they smile on the idea of people getting married. And then there's about 20% who don't. Although, interestingly, the polling suggests that uh, a big majorities want William to succeed the current Queen rather than his father, Charles. And I keep saying to people, so what you want to do is you want to skip the hereditary principle and choose our head of state. That's fine. That's called democracy. If he wants to run in an election, I got no problem with that. Well, I think um, soon, as soon as we finish this interview, we will pass the anti-nausea pills around. <laughs> but so, I want to. I may ask, vomit live on air you, now if you keep showing these clips. We last talked to you about um, the whole issue of the uncut movement. Yeah. Uh, explain that and what's happening right now as we look at the images of uh, the royal wedding and the amount of money that has been spent. Um, talk about what's happening in Britain. Well, there's a similar thing going on here in the U.S. Democracy Now! viewers will know General Electric, one of the biggest corporations in America, not only paid no taxes last year, but was given $3 billion by the Exchequer, which means that everyone watching this who pays taxes, whether they're a fireman or a teacher or a cab driver, their money was taken and given to GE and its shareholders who already have more money than they could ever possibly spend. Similar process was going on in Britain. Companies like Vodafone, one of our biggest cell phone companies, a man called Philip Green, the sixth richest man in Britain, paid no tax. So Vodafone, which uh, complied with the Egyptian uh, despot Mubarak yeah. in shutting down the entire system of, uh, of Egypt during the protests. There's a whole catalogue of horror about Vodafone. We could do a whole show about them. But the and they own something like 45 percent of Verizon Wireless in the United States. Yeah, and their tax bill was effectively cancelled by the last government. They were refusing to pay their taxes for years, uh, and by the current British government, sorry, the Conservative government, who then immediately took them on a taxpayer-funded trip of India to promote their business. A lot of people in Britain were watching this. Ordinary citizens, like I'm sure a lot of your ordinary citizens are watching this and just being horrified but feeling powerless. And they said, you know what, a group of ordinary people, they were teachers and doctors, firefighters, they said, why don't we just go to our local Vodafone store one day and shut it down? Why don't we just hold up signs saying, you want to operate on our streets, pay our taxes? They went and they did it one Saturday. It got a little bit of media attention, about 100 people. But then something really interesting happened. Three days later, in a completely different city, quite far away from London, also in Britain, another group of people went and shut down their Vodafone store. They were so enraged by it. 
Then another group of people did it, and it spread within a few weeks in almost every city in Britain, including some of the most conservative parts of Britain. Vodafone stores were shut down. The UK Uncut movement became a huge thing. It's really captured the public imagination, and it's shown the lie that we need this austerity. Even if you bought the idea that we need cuts, in fact, we need a Keynesian stimulus, but even if you bought that, £120 billion every year is being avoided and evaded by the richest people in Britain. A huge amount of any saving that has to be made. They're the people who caused this crisis, they're the people who can most afford to pay, and they're the people who should pay. There's been um, a brilliant uh, break, uh, imitation group here in the United States called US Uncut that people can find that are doing the same thing here. Bank of America, they physically shut down lots of their branches saying, you can't do this to us. It's, it's ordinary citizens acting in their own self-defense saying, you can't just take our money. We won't allow this to happen. You can't do this to us anymore. So I have one last question and on a completely different topic since we rarely get you on the show uh, here live. Uh, you've been writing a lot about uh, Libya and your concerns about the, uh, the international campaign now uh, and the bombing campaign uh, in support of the rebels uh, against uh, Gaddafi. Can you talk, uh, tell us, uh, give us a summary of your concerns about this? Well, Colonel Gaddafi is an absolutely disgusting dictator. And uh, no one should be in any doubt about that. But my concern is the motives of our governments very plainly are not humanitarian. Indeed, they're very plainly to do with oil. And although there may be a temporary, uh, there clearly is a temporary overlap between the wishes of the rebels, who are overwhelmingly good people, and the whims of the American imperial power, the British imperial power, French imperial power, that overlap will be very brief. And when there is a divergence between those interests, the American and British governments will be very strongly in favour of repressing the will of the Libyan people. If the Libyan people can free themselves, one of the most basic things we know is they will want to control that oil supply, and that means they'll be immediately punished and turned on. So there will be an attempt to... I think what's happened is, you, for the first time in 60 years, the area that has the largest pot of oil in the world has begun to show some independence. It's begun to break free. And I think this is what this is in reality tragically, is a way of reasserting Western, raw Western power in the middle of a chaotic situation. They don't want to allow the, the oil supply to run out of control. If they were really interested in human rights, they would not be allying with the worst human rights abusers in the whole region, the Saudi Arabian tyranny, who, you know, as we were saying, don't even allow women to drive, horsewhip rape victims. You know, if they're your best friends, your claims to be defending human rights are preposterous. Johan Harry, I want to thank you very much for being with us. British journalist who writes a twice-weekly column for the Independent newspaper, and he's the presenter of the Johan Hari podcast. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. And as this broadcast took place, uh, the uh, couple that got married today, oh. Kate um, and William, the kiss happened, and then there was a military flyover to seal it, I suppose. Right. Undermining all the points we just made. <laughs> this is democracy.